ครับผมก็ขอบคุณสำหรับคำเชื้อเชิญนะครับจากอาจารย์ธีระเดชแล้วก็ขอบคุณทางผู้จัดงานด้วยนะครับก็ทอล์กนี้ขออนุญาตบรรยายเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับเพราะว่ามีคนสนใจจากต่างประเทศที่เป็นเพื่อนร่วมงานอะไรอย่างนี้ด้วยครับก็ขออนุญาตเป็นภาษาอังกฤษนะครับโอเค so the title of today is kind of mixture um, one area is the geometry of Alexandrov which is kind of non-Euclidean but not only that it is non-Riemannian also okay so it's kind of non-smooth generalization of a manifold of a, a Riemannian manifold and we also kind of apply this knowledge to 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 see what we can do with convex analysis which uh, is a kind of foundation to convex optimization especially for today Uh, and by the way, I am Karin Chaitanya. I work for Department of Mathematics, King Mongkut University of Technology, t o n b u r i and I am also affiliated with a uh, center of excellence in theoretical and computational science. There, uh, I work on mainly two topics right now. Uh, first one is, as you can see, the Alexandrov geometry and its applications in optimization. And um, another topic is more applied. I work on multi-agent optimization with the aim to uh, actually I have a very specific model in uh, multi-agent optimization that I work on, which is called multi-leader follower games, and it has fascinating applications in uh, industrial worlds. Okay, so let me. Give you a very short introduction about KMTT. So, we uh, in the Department of Math we have kind of 30 to 40 bachelors each year. We have around 40 graduate students totally, and we have um, 42 right now. Is, I think it's 43 academic staff and four supporting staffs, and we work. Uh, we have uh, broad disciplinaries in applied math. Uh, we have some pure math as well. Graph theory, the algebra, and so on. But many of us are working on applied math. Okay, so before we we get started, I would like to introduce to you some of the classical results that we found in today's class uh, convex analysis. Okay, so what is convex analysis? Once again, it is the study of convex functions. Basically, the convex functions. So it serves as a background or a foundation to convex optimization, um, both theoretically and in practice sense. Um, one of the most classical result is that when we have uh, a proper lower semi-continuous function, we can characterize this convexity with its uh, subdifferential, which is denoted like like this. Okay, it looks like a boundary, but it's not. It is. It's called a subdifferential. Okay, uh, uh, the convexity of a function can be characterized by the monotonicity of this subdifferential operator. It is a set-valued operator. You will see the clear definition of this later in the talk. And um, whenever this function happens to be continuously differentiable, then this subdifferentiable turns into a gradient. Okay, so this. Uh, Subdifferential serves as kind of generalization to um, the gradient of f, because the function can be uh, non-differentiable at some of the points in the domain. And we have the second one. So, for any given proper lower semi-continuous convex function f, we know that this effective domain of the sub subdifferential here. Is dense in the domain of F. Um, here, the function that we are considering is defined on some uh, space into the extended real. Okay, so we include plus infinity value. Um, we do not include minus infinity. Actually, we can, but um, whenever the function have minus infinity value and it is Uh, lower semi-continuous and proper, then all the 
sorry, not proper, then all the domain has to be empty. So it's not uh, interesting. So um, this is the definition of the domain of F. How about this domain of a partial, uh, sorry, not partial, the subdifferential of F? It is the set of points where this subdifferential is not empty. Remember, it is a set value mapping, so it can take empty set value as well. So this effective domain means the, the points where uh, the subdifferential is not empty. And uh, th this domain is dense in, in the domain of F. Um, the third one, we know that whenever X bar minimizes a proper lower semi-continuous fu uh, convex function, then the sub, uh, sub differential at that point contains a zero vector and vice versa. Okay, these are if and only if. So uh, we have one more. Actually, these, these uh, first three items are the key results if you want to apply to uh, convex optimization theoretically. But if you want to approach it from an algorithm point of view, you have to well consider these kind of dynamical systems. Then you can uh, discretize it, and then you get uh, the, 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 the algorithms for that. If you use forward Euler discretization, then you will get the gradient descent method. If you do it with the backward Euler, then you've got the proximal method. And for this, uh, we call this subgradient fold because uh, it, uh, well, if this subdifferential is replaced with the gradient, we call it the gradient flow. But here it's not. It says that um, the changes in x, changes of x. Uh, is a sub subgradient of, of f, so this is called a subgradient flow, and we know that the trajectory of this dynamical system um, converges weakly to a minimizer of f, one of the minimizer of f, whenever f has at least one minimizer. Okay, so I said weakly here because we can extend this into Hilbert spaces, not only in Euclidean but into Hilbert spaces, into Banach spaces, into Hilbert manifold, and so on. Um, okay, and then we, we recall this first uh, result. We know that f is convex. I mean, for lower semi-continuous and proper, f is convex, even only if the subdifferential is uh, a monotone operator. So this um, set value operator then generalized into a monotone operator without being a subdifferential of some convex function. And it turns out that the theory of monotone operator is very, very useful today because it can capture, uh, for example, multi-agent optimization that I work on. Okay, so the multi-agent optimization problem is not the classical optimization problem, the kind of coupled system of optimization problems, but um, it can be transformed somehow into solving monotone operator equations. So some of the um, benefits are, first, finding this turns out to be useful, as I mentioned just earlier. And we also know that this dynamical system captures several more cases than the subgradient flow. Okay, for example, um, we can capture rotational dynamics that cannot be done with subdifferential. Um, even though this can be regarded as one of the very close generalization of the subgradient flow, it turns out that the behavior of this dynamical system can be vastly different from the subgradient flow. Okay, so our goal in this presentation is very, very simple. We want to extend this theory of convex functions and monotone operators from, let's say, from Euclidean or from Hubert spaces, or simply from linear spaces, into metric spaces. Okay, so Simply, we take out the linearity and see what can be done. Okay, but this is not quite um, possible in general metric spaces. We need some strengthening on that space. And um, that strengthening is actually the tool of AD Alexandrov. So let's see a face of this AD Alexandrov. He was um, 
a Russian mathematician, geometer, um, very famous for not only for geometry, for probabilities, for anything. He is very famous from the Russian territories. And he was the first one to, to study Riemannian geometry, but not on the Riemannian manifold. He, he studied the Riemannian geometry on general metric spaces. Okay? So what did I mean? Study so Riemannian geometry, it means the properties that is analogous to the one that we study in Riemannian geometry. Like um, how to define curvature in metric space. You know, in, in, in Riemannian geometry, a very useful tool is calculus. You can use calculus to define almost everything. That's why we call it differential geometry. But here we take out the smooth structure and see what would happen, how to define the curvature. Okay. Uh, and here is a fun fact about um, this person. So Alexandrov is one of the advisors of the famous mathematician Gregory Perlman, if you know him. So he was the one who rejected the, uh, the, the Abel Prize and also the Field Medal. And now he disappeared. <laughs> okay. Now let's, since we talked about Alexandrov, we have to introduce some mathematicians right now. So I mentioned that um, Alexandrov would like to know how to define curvature on metric space without using calculus. So by that time, he, he noticed one of the characterization of the sectional curvature on Riemannian manifold. If you are familiar with Riemannian geometry, you may heard of several concepts of curvature. For example, you may know Gaussian curvature, you may know Ricci curvature, uh, and the curvature tensor itself, which is not a scalar. But here, the concept of sectional curvature is a scalar curvature. I would not dive into how we define this, but um, we can characterize the sectional curvature of a Riemannian manifold um, by um, using triangles, geodesic triangles. We will see that later. So um, this curvature can be characterized purely in the metric terms without using any calculus at all. So the, the metric space with such curvature bounded concept was nowadays called um, Katz. Actually, it's Cat Kappa, but the focus on uh, focus today is um, the non-positive sectional curvature. So it, the curvature is bounded above by zero. So that's why we call the space Cat Zero Space. You may you may have heard about this space. Um, this term was coined by this guy, Mikhail Gromov. He was one of the Abel laureates as well. Okay, so this guy coined this term cats zero space to celebrate the contribution of the three other geometer. The first one is Emil Cotton. The second one was Alexandrov himself. This is the other portrait of him. So this one is being more serious. And this one, not so, I don't know, maybe equally serious. And the third one is Toponogov. So why so? Because firstly, uh, Emil Cotton studied what is uh, now known as the cotton hartmann manifold. He studied manifold in the case of curvature, uh, sectional curvature bounded above by zero. Um, Alexandrov, right, he, he took the definition of Toponogov because Toponogov was the one who proved the metric characterization of sectional curvature bounded above. Okay, so CAT, CAT, formed by these three famous uh, geometer. Um, one thing to notice is that all of them are French, except, uh, sorry, all of them are Russian, except Carton, who was a French. And uh, now Gromov moved to Fran France also. Okay, before we get into serious stuff, let me, it's my, it's my philosophy to give you some quotes from mathematicians before and after the talk. Okay, so Henri Poincaré once said that geometry is the art of drawing correct conclusions, but from an incorrectly drawn figures. 
I totally agree with him. <laughs> Especially when we, con when we consider non-Euclidean geometry. Okay. Now let's dive into things. What we are going, going to see in this talk, um, you will see mainly these four topics. We will introduce, try to introduce these four uh, results. First, we want to know how to define subdifferential and how to generalize it into monotone vector fields. Actually, we want to do, define monotone vector fields, but subdifferential is one of the case. And then we consider resolvents of a monotone vector field and then dive into how to, um, how to tackle the, the dynamical system that, is, that was given by, by this inclusion. Okay, and one note here that the approach that I used in this talk will unify the theory of monotone operators and monotone vector fields from both Hilbert space and Hadamard manifold. Hadamard manifolds mean uh, simply connected, complete Riemannian manifold whose sectional curvature is globally bounded above by zero. Okay. <laughs> okay, so I have to I have to state this because there was an approach earlier that tackled monotone operators in this cat zero space, but that approach was only generalized the concept from human space. It, it was a different concept from Hadamard manifold. Okay, so I in this talk I try to give a, a, a unifying approach that will generalize both from Hubert space theory and Hadamard manifold theory. So what are the difficulties? First, we don't have the access to linearities. In Euclidean or in um, Hubert meta Banach space, whatever, you have linear everywhere. It's a linear space after all. If you move to the territory of Riemannian manifold, you have locally linear structure. Because on a manifold locally, you can approximate a neighborhood with um, uh, an open set in some Euclidean space. As long as you keep yourself within that, uh, we, we call it an injective radius, the radius that, that can be approximated using um, Euclidean geometry, you are fine. You have some linear structures after all. But here, in Alexandrov space or in Katsuro space, we don't have the linearity at all. What is um, the other difficulty? We don't have access to calculus. In Euclidean space or in Hilbert space, in linear space, you can use the classical calculus that we know. On Riemannian manifold, well, you can lift points from the manifold locally onto the tangent space. Tangent space is uh, isomorphic to uh, some Euclidean space. So you have that linearity from the, Euclidean, uh, from the tangent space. And then after the, you do all the calculations, you project that down. Uh, these projections that are back and forth between manifolds and the tangent space is known as the exponential map and the inverse exponential map. It is a different morphism, by the way. Okay, and one word for Alexandrov geometry, we don't have any of that. Okay, so what is the challenge for us is to try to find the appropriate notion for the first order structure. Okay, calculus is kind of first order structure at least because you can at least use the derivative. Okay, but before we go into, once again, I said before we go into the main topic, I would like to motivate you that um, why do we need to consider these kind of problems? Okay, okay, I do it for fun. <laughs> but we have more motivating reasons and it's very uh, interesting too. So first, Let's consider this phylogenetics. Okay, what is the phylogenetics? You can see that above each animal here, you have kind of tree structures. Okay, it turns out, oh, let me tell you first what is phylogenetic. It is kind of evolution trees, evolution of species. For example, if we found some newly emerging virus and we want to trace 
where does it come from? We may use this phylogenetic tree to see the, uh, it will be generated by Monte Carlo method, method to, to, to obtain the list of possible um, ancestors. I don't know. Yeah, I think that's the word. Possible ancestor of that newly emerging DNA. And okay, when you do this, it will not give you only one tree. You will get a list of possibilities. Okay, each name on the list, you will be accompanied with the probability. Okay, so you have the distributions. You may have hundreds of them, thousands of them. But what if I want just one representative of those lists? So the, the most natural thing to do is to take the expectation, right? But this is not a linear space. It turns out that these phylogenetic tree structures does not live in a Euclidean space. It lives in um, the space is called the, I usually call it the phylogenetic forest because it cons consists of trees. And it turns out that this forest has a cat zero structure. It is not a manifold, but it is a cat zero space. And to take the expectation on this space, you cannot use just the average sum. You don't have the sum, remember, you don't have linearity. So what, what you do is you optimize, you minimize some functions. Okay? And that function is convex. So it's convex optimization. Actually, I have to see geodesic convex optimization on a cat zero space, strictly on a cat zero space, not on a manifold. Okay, so this is one example of the need of optimization theory on cat zero space. The other one, which is very, 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 very popular right now, is the optimal transport. I don't know if you know this uh, optimal transport theory. Uh, I think the last, in the last 10 years, this topic has received two field medals. And those two field medalists came from uh, a common advisor. Luigi Ambrosio. Okay, so what is optimal transport? It is, uh, so here you have one probability measure, and here you have another one. The question is, what is the optimal way to transport the mass, let's say at 0 0.5, and actually it's everywhere here, but let's say you have a pile of mass here at 0 0.5, how to optimally transport this mass into this target measure. And it turns out that this optimal transport um, theory requires some geometry. Okay? It turns out that the, the optimal value for transportation gives the metric structure on the space of all probability measures on that space. And this one is a cat zero space whenever the, the domain of this, uh, the support of, of each measure is um, R. And it turns out if uh, the, the, the dimension of the support is higher than one, then you have the other case, which is the electron row space of curvature bounded below. In this talk, we consider the case of uh, curvature bounded of both by zero. Um, so that covers already the case of one dimensional support. That is al already a, a, a big gap. For example, if we consider Nash equilibrium problem, I, I always go into multi agent optimization. So if we go to Nash equilibrium problem, there is one solution concept which is called the mixed Nash equilibrium. So instead of having only one solution, you have a distribution of how um, you would need to use the strategies. So right now, only in the known results of mixed Nash on finite support measures is known. But if we use this result, then we can generalize this into infinite, uh, no, I mean continuous support. 
case. Actually, it's one of my work. Okay, so that's two interesting examples of the need to use optimization on cat zero spaces. And it's strictly on cat zero spaces. Uh, I also would like to note that in this case, it also does not generate a manifold. It generates a cat zero space. Or a cat, uh, CBB space, which is Alexandrov space of curvature bounded from below. Okay, a quick state of the art. What is happening? What is happening now? Right now? <laughs> okay, so the, uh, the theory of convex function has long known for uh, in, in linear spaces, it's long known. In the Riemannian manifold, which is a kind of intermediate step between Euclidean case, linear case, and Alexandrov case, was also known for a long time. For example, we have one dedicated, a big book dedicated to this topic, published in 1994, so it's a pretty long time. And it's still growing. Right now, for example, in this, um, this um, result by Bumo, um, he found a way to use Riemannian manifold optimization in machine learning, for example. And actually, this is the right tool for kernel technique. If you know machine learning, then the kernel technique optimization is actually the Riemannian manifold optimization. And for Alexandrov space, for CAT0 space, the first convex analytical result emerges in um, 2013. So about nine years from now. No, back from now. So um, the proximal method was studied in, 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 in this year by Miroslav Bashak. And actually the tools that he used was uh, the tool of Jones and Major. Um, these two published um, convex analytical results that concerns with the subgradient flows. And what it was uh, published in the 90s. Okay, but the, uh, the optimization centric result was first arrived in 2013. And, okay, so the theory of convex analysis of convex optimization in this space goes on and on until today. And one of the big questions in this theory is how about the monotone theory? How about the first order version of the convex analysis? Okay, um, the first Two, I would say first two because they were published at the same time in the same journal in the same volume accidentally. So the first one was these two guys, Iranian guys, Katip Sadeh and Ranjma, and also with me when I was a PhD student, I tackled this approach independently, of course. <laughs> so um, both of these two works, we use what is known as the dual space. So we try to define a dual space to this cat zero space. And it turns out that um, the monotone operator theory that uses this approach generalizes the result from Hubert space. But it turns out as well that it has no relationship with the case of uh, Adamant manifold. So after some years, I thought about this and I had an idea that this may not be a, 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 the right tool. So it works mathematically, but it may not be the right tool, the appropriate tool. So in this talk, I, I use another approach, which is the approach of the tangent cone or tangent space. Um, here are some notes about those advancements in Riemannian manifold. So the monotonicity was studied on manifold since 1999, and it continues until today as well. Um, no big advancement, I think, but it continues to grow. Okay, so in this talk, I present another approach that will unify both cases of Hubert spaces and um, an Adamant uh, manifold. So first, we have to know the definitions of cat zero space or the space of non-positive curvature. Okay, so right now, 
we only assume that X is a matrix space. Okay? So we call that this matrix space is a geode geodesic space. If for any two points, you take any two points on X. Um, these two points can be connected by a curve, which is sigma here. Um, the, um, the domain of definition is from zero to the distance between the two points, and it satisfies this. So, roughly speaking, for any x, y, you can find a curve, which is isometry to a, 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 a unit, uh, sorry, not unit, uh, a closed interval. Okay, so this curve sigma will be called minimizing judicy. And if such minimizing geodesic is uniquely defined for each of the pairs, then we call that space uniquely geodesic space. And we write, in, in that case, because the geodesic is uniquely determined, we will write this kind of segment to denote the geodesic segment, which is the image of that geodesic. And we also develop this kind of semi-convex combination. It's not really an algebraic notion, so that we have to um, denote it with this kind of alternative to the addition. Because you have the geodesic con connecting the two points, so any points on the geodesic segment joining them can be thought of somehow as kind of convex combination between the two points. What is this? Okay, we can skip. Okay, right now we assume that X is uniquely geodesic. You can think of several examples from this. And we pick any three points from that. Each two points are joined by a unique geodesic. So you have a, a, a triangle, kind of triangle. And that triangle is called geodesic triangle. It's denoted here. And it's just a union of all the geodesics joining the three points. Now we can always find at least one triangle which we denoted by this delta bar. We call this um, triangle in Euclidean plane, a comparison triangle, if they have the same side lengths. We can always construct this because we have the triangle inequality. So here on the left hand side you have the geodesic triangle on, on X. And on the right hand side, you have a triangle on the Euclidean plane. Okay, so you can see that x and y have some length, and the length of x bar and y bar are the same, similar for the other two sides. Okay, this one is um, the comparison triangle of this geodesic triangle. And this comparison triangle is, of course, not unique. It is unique up to rigid motion, but it is not unique. Okay, now we take any point P that is lying on a geodesic segment between X and Y. Suppose P is here. Then we can always pick a point P bar on this comparison triangle. P bar is here. So that the length of X to P and X bar to P are the same. And the length of P to Y and P bar to Y bar are the same. Okay, so this point P bar will be called a comparison point to this point P. Now, we are ready to define what a cat zero space is. So a cat zero space is a uniquely geodesic matrix space for which, a, for any given three points, so we have the geodesic triangle here and the comparison triangle here, this um, comparison inequality always hold. What does it tell you? It tells you that, okay, you pick three points, that means you pick one geodesic triangle, you construct the um, comparison triangle, you pick one point, let's say the point is on this, this segment, okay? Then you have um, the comparison point and the length here from, um, from the opposite um, vertex to P, the distance here have to be shorter or at least shorter than the length here, the comparative length. So it roughly means that the triangle that lies in this cat zero space have to be thinner than the Euclidean triangle. Okay? So this is the cat zero space if 
for any triangles, you have this condition. And you have a theorem here that states that if M is an Adamant manifold, that is a shortened term for the definition here. So if M is complete, simply connected, Riemannian manifold, then M here has global non-positive sectional curvature, even only if it is a cat zero space. So you can see that um, the, the notion of non-positive sectional curvature can be characterized purely in terms of metric. So this is the result by um, Viktor Toponokov, where Alexandrov himself took advantage of and turns this condition into a theorem, uh, sorry, a definition for uh, a cat zero space. But still, we have this space, but the structure is not the same as a manifold because you lack calculus, you lack local linearity. Um, and here is another characterization for the cat zero inequality. First, x is cat zero space. Second, you can characterize it like this. So instead of consider this length, you can take any two points on the side and then the length here will be shorter than the length, comparative length here. They are equivalent. And you can also say that um, the distance squared is kind of uh, uh, strongly convex. Because you have, you have this additional term, meaning that it, with the convexity of this squared distance is strong. And you also have this kind of generalization to the Apollonius identity, which turns into an inequality. We also need to know how to measure the, the, the angle. So here we fix a point P, one point on the space, and then from that point, it branches to geodesics that emerge from this point P. Then what will be the angle between these two geodesics? It can be defined, again, using the compar comparison angle. So, okay. Here is P, and here are two geodesics. The upper one is alpha, the other one is beta. Okay, and you have the, the, the comparison triangle for this large uh, geodesic triangle, this one. Okay, and here is in Euclidean space, so you can measure the angle. And then you move down, move downward. When you move down, this is um, a new geodesic triangle, and in general, it will it will um, generate another comparison triangle. It's not it's not the it's not the one inside here, but it can be a different one. So the angle here can be different than than the one earlier, and then you keep decreasing this, so you uh, you take the limit of this one. 2 at 0, and that is the definition for Alexandrov angle. Um, you, can, you can decrease this one side, or you can decrease both sides at the same time. They are equivalent. You require to work out a little bit, but they are equivalent. And it turns out that on a Riemannian manifold, I think I did not include this. Yeah, on a Riemannian manifold, you can measure the angle using um, by, by projecting these two geodesics onto the, the tangent space, and from there you can measure the projected angle. And it turns out that that Riemannian angle and this Alexandrov angle coincides on manifolds, okay? Now we need the space of directions. We can use that Alexandrov angle to define an equivalent classes. So two geodesics are said to be equivalent if their Alexandrov angle is zero. This is quite different from Adamat space. On the Adamat space, if the two angle, uh, if the two geodesic chairs, I mean, uh, if the angle between them is zero, it means they are kind of the same. One one have to be contained in another one. Okay, so they are 
uh, overlapping. But in this case, no. You can have zero angle while the two geodesics are not overlapping at all. That's one strange point. So um, the quotient matrix space that is generated by, um, by this one will be called the space of direction. And um, the, the matrix here is actually this Alexandrov angle. It turns out that the angle plays as um, the matrix on this space of direction. And from this space of direction, we are not ending here. From this space of direction, we um, generate a Euclidean cone over it. Um, sorry, here have to be zero, not cone P, it's cone zero, which tells you that you generate the cone in the Euclidean fashion. Here is the definition. Um, you take the uh, space of direction here, and then you uh, product it with this half ray. And then you take, the, um, you take the quotient with the equivalent class given by this. So the two tangent vector, we call this tangent vector even though it's not a vector. Um, so these two tangent vectors are equivalent if um, here both T1 and T2 are zero or um, T1 and T2 are non-zero but equal and um, sigma 1 and sigma 2 have the same directions. So what does it mean to have space of direction and tangent cone? So space of direction means you, what, what we are looking for is only the direction, not how far we go in that direction. Okay, We go here without stating how far and this tangent cone means this direction and how far do we need to go? So we go to the direction sigma 1 and how far it's t1 distance. And on this tangent cone we can define also the, uh, the metric there. Okay. So <laughs> this one has a strong influence from the cosine law. If you try to draw out then this is exactly the cosine law. So this is the um, distance on the tangent space. We call this the tangent space, which is denoted by TP. Okay, and we denote this 0P to be an equivalent class of going nowhere, zero direction. Okay, zero direction means any direction that you, you do not go anywhere, T is zero. Uh, it, turn, it also turns out that the tangent cone or tangent space is also a cat zero space. This can be a little tricky to visualize. On a Riemannian manifold, this tangent cone coincides with the tangent space. So the theory is very, very nice. Okay, so here we have kind of scalar product. It's kind of inner product between the two, um, two tangent vectors. It's defined very similarly to the case of Euclidean space. Okay, so when everything is nice, meaning that if x is a Hilbert space, this is the inner product of the space. If x is a manifold, then this one is the Riemannian matrix. Okay, and for convenience, we use this notion, gamma dot is kind of direction of the geodesic joining P to X, okay? The direction of this geodesic is the direction of that geodesic itself, and how far we go, we go to the distance between P and X. Okay, so this one is kind of uh, inverse exponential map of this space. Okay, here just some notions, some, some, some comments that when x is a manifold, everything turns back to the classical results. Now, we go to the sub-differential. We still have some time, I think. Okay, so now I assume that x is a cat zero space. What happens? We can define the convexity using the geodesics that we have. So the set is um, convex if it 
contains all the geodesics joining the two points, two elements, two of its elements. And the function is um, convex if the epigraph given by this is a convex set. So natural definitions. Or you can, if you prefer to compute, then you have this characterization of convexity of a function. And once again, for convenience, we use this gamma naught x to denote the set of all functions phi defined from x and valued in open minus infinity to close plus infinity. So we allow the plus infinity value. Okay. And we consider, uh, consider this kind of functions that are convex, lower semi-continuous, and proper. So proper function here means that um, this function has to take real value somewhere. The effective domain is not empty. So it's not identically plus infinity. It has to take real values somewhere on, the, on, on x. And we can define the proximal operator right here. Um, this is a kind of resolvent. Okay, we will come back to this later. Right now, it's kind of you try to regularize this convex function with a strongly convex term. And if you are in a manifold or you are in a Hilbert space, this one um, is the resolvent of the gradient if the function is differentiable, and it's the resolvent of the subgradient if the function is non differentiable. And here is our subdifferential. The subdifferential here takes the value on the tangent space at the point that you input. Okay? You input the point P. The subdifferential is a set of all tangent vectors at that point P. That satisfies this. So, what does it mean here on the right hand side? It means that um, you have a kind of um, linear function, affine function that supports the, the, the graph of that function. So, so when a convex function looks like something like this, then at, you pick a point and then you have a tangent that supports the graph. And of course, I say tangent, but it's not have to be a tangent because the function can be non-differentiable. And in that case, um, when the function can, the straight line can be like rotating around, pivoting at the point P, so on this side, it says that it takes the gradient of those straight line that supports the function, the graph of the function at that point. And we have some results. Um, first, we know that if the function phi belongs to this class, so proper lower semi-continuous convex, if phi satisfies those conditions, then for any lambda and for any q, um, you can find Oh, I missed out something here. So you can find a point P for which um, prox Q equals to prox of P. Sorry, this is not what I would like to say. Okay. So any lambda and any Q, we can find a point P for which uh, this is the definition of prox once more. So you can find a point P for which prox of P equals to Q. So it's kind of subjectivity condition. And we have this. We know that this tangent vector belongs to the subgradient, even only if P belongs to prox here at the point Q. One here is um, for the case of lambda equals to one. Okay? We have this characterization. And we also know this that the uh, effective domain of the subdifferential is dense in that one, uh, that of um, phi. Okay? Well, we have the analogous results from the linear space case and from the Riemannian geometry case. But I would like to mention that the proof are completely different. We rely on a completely different tool. If you look at the original proof in linear case, the proof is very pretty simple. You just try to compute out everything and it's quite straightforward using linear structure to sync algebra. Okay, and for the last one we also know that if P minimizes the function phi, then we have these um, two characterization first. Um, the subdifferential here have to contain the, uh, the, the zero vector and also 
um, p is a fixed point of the proximal operator. We have this kind of um, characterizations. And um, the last two equivalents actually came quite obviously from the first one. And if we take, um, this is one of the example that um, shows that the geometry here is completely different from, in the, uh, from, from the manifold case. So here I take the normal point, which is the sub, uh, sub differential of this um, indicator function. This indicator function is not the classical one from set theory. It will take zero value on the set, and it takes plus infinity value outside. Okay, and if you take um, C to be non-empty closed and convex set, then the subdifferential here turns out to be a normal cone. And the classical result about normal cone in manifold and in linear case is that um, the normal cone will be trivial, meaning that it only contains zero vector if and only if that point P belongs to the interior of C. But here is not that case we can find the case that um, the normal cone contains only zero vector, but that point lies on the boundary, not on the interior. So this, this is one of the property that, that is pretty different from, from the other cases that we found earlier in the classical literature. Um, actually, we can, we can impose conditions so, so that it, it recovers into the, the classical results that uh, we have to use geodesic extension property and so on. I will not focus on that. Okay, so this is just to, to, to um, give you an example that you know, things are, are different from the classical literature. And the monotone vector field here, I mean, um, a mapping that is defined on x to tx. tx here is just the union of tpx, the union of all um, tangent spaces. Um, or in differential geometry, it's called the tangent bundle, which is again a manifold, but in this case, we do not have any structure on tx. Okay, so we say that a vector field A is monotone if this inequality holds for every points on the graph of that vector field, okay? So the monotonicity here means that if you, if you move from x to y along this direction, then the value will not go into the opposite way. It will go along with, um, it will make the acute angle with the uh, direction of increase. And we can have some results. Um, Related to the the, the subdifferential, for example, if p belongs to this gamma zero x, then the subdifferential um, is maximally monotone. Is monotone, and the graph of this monotone vector field will not be contained in the graph of other monotone vector fields, and so on. And we also have the resolvent here. Okay, the, the resolvent, the real resolvent. If you input x into the resolvent of this, um, of this vector field A, then it means you want to find the point Z for which um, from point Z, this direction belongs to uh, the vector field lambda AZ. And uh, we have some questions about the well definition of, of this resolvent operator, which is still an open problem right now in cat zero space. Um, I have been working on this problem for five or six years. I still have no idea. Oops. Okay. Okay, here are some basic properties that we have with the resolvent. Um, it is well defined and single valued if um, A satisfies the subjectivity conditions, which is actually meaning that um, this one is, well, it, we can show that it is equivalent 
to saying that the set is not empty. But whenever it is not empty, we have it single valued. This is the this is the key point, and we know that the fixed point of this operator is actually the solution set of this zero point problem, and we know this um, this where is it uh, here? This equation j lambda x equals to j mu u. Um, this is a useful tool when you want to change the parameter, and this is very useful when you try to generate the solution of the generalized gradient flow. And um, j lambda is fairly non-expansive. Okay, so what, here, here is another point that we can, I can say that it takes completely different tools from the classical literature if you want to prove the result, especially for, the, um, for this resolvent identity. In linear case, it's one line proof. But here you require some geometric tools. If that J, uh, if that A is a subdifferential, then the resolvent is actually the prox operator. We have some other tools. Um, I should skip by the time being. Um, I would like just to say that when um, the geodesics can be extended into a geodesic line, which means the isometry of R. It means uh, we, we have that this domain is convex. The closure of the domain is convex. And we also know that when you take this to the extreme case, meaning that when lambda goes to zero, then this one becomes the projection operator, metric projection operator. And if you take the other side, if you increase the lambda indefinitely, then this one will also be a projected uh, projection operator, but onto the solution set. So these these two are two extreme cases, two asymptotic properties, when you when you increase or decrease lambda to its limit. And okay, so it has been questions. Please let me extend this just a little bit. Okay, so. It, it has been in question for quite a long time how to define the dynamical system on this space because you don't have calculus. So it turns out that um, the solution of a gradient flow can be characterized by some of the semi-group. The semi-group here, I mean here, um, the set of ST, where T is um, non-negative. Non and this set, uh, this family will satisfy all these four properties. Okay, so this is kind of dynamical system if you look at it closely. So this one is non expansive. Okay, this is geometric property. The other one, if you go from the start, if you let the time pass by s plus t, it's the same as you go from zero to s, and then from, sorry, from zero to t, and then from there you let time pass to another s. So this is kind of dynamical system. Okay, so from the start, you input x0, it starts from x0, and this one, the generated trajectory is continuous. So this is the definition of a non-expansive semi-group, which is non-expansive because of the first one. And it turns out that in, in linear spaces and in, uh, in, in, in manifold cases, the solution of the subgradient flow and also the generalized one using monotone operators can be characterized using the semi-group properties. Okay? And here we, we, we do the same thing. Um, so we cannot really do this because we don't have the x dot. We don't have calculus, remember? So we have to use this uh, non-expansive definition. So the semi-group definition. It turns out that if we repeatedly iterate this resolvent operator of a maximum monotone vector field, then it will generate a semi-group. Okay? And this semi-group, if X here happens to be a Hilbert space or an Adamant manifold, then this one satisfies this property. So it generates the solution for this dynamical system for the generalized um, subgradient flows. With a very good estimation, 
So the big O of T over square root of K. Quite, quite impressive. And I think it can be improved, but quite impressive by far. Okay, and the property of the trajectory that we generated is, well, concluded in this theorem. So if the trajectory is bounded, then it will converge just weakly to the point that uh, AX contains the zero vector. Okay, so if the trajectory is unbounded, then it will not converge. We can find an example that it will not converge. It behaves uh, a bit differently to the case of the subdifferential. And one last word is that um, this approach using the tangent cone, which can be quite tricky a lot of time, it uh, gives, right now it gives a solution for how to define this real gradient flow in, in cat zero space. It was long-standing open questions, but it was solved last year, 2021, that, okay, at least, at, at last, they discovered how to define the real gradient flow here. And the concept that they use is based on a kind of improvement to our subdifferential notions using the approach of tangent, um, tangent space and tangent cones. And that is the conclusion as well for my talk. And if um, for, for, for the interested audiences, if you want um, an extended version of this lecture, which is obviously very fast today, um, you can go to this website. Um, it was my lecture, eight hour lecture on this topic. I gave the lecture uh, on December last year at University um, Côte d'Azur in France, in Nice, France. Okay, and I invite, if you are interested, please take a look here. Okay, and here is the last quote from my cat. Okay, if you are not shy like me, you can try to say this. <laughs> okay, since I am a shy one, I will not read this out. Okay, thank you very much um, to all the audience and also to the organizers of this um, seminar. Thank you very much. Okay, then <laughs> thank you again for being here.